Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moli wanji, namaste, jumbo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We're coming to you from the lovely town of Metropolis in the great state of Illinois. We are so happy and so honored that you would join us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show, and please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Mike, Dr. Michael Gurian. He is here to celebrate the Stone Boys. Before we invite Dr. Michael into the studio, you might be wondering why we're coming to you from Metropolis and from Orlando and from other places. We are in the midst of an epic cross-continent adventure. We are exhibiting at the TTO Today Expo in St. Louis, Missouri, and then heading out to sunny Costa Mesa, California, to be a part of the Orange County Children's Book Festival. And you are joining us along the way. Really, we're real excited to be here in Metropolis. It's the home of Superman. And if you check out our social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, and our Twitter, uh, at Jedley Magic, you'll be able to see pictures of me in front of the Superman statue here in Metropolis. Join us right now from the great state of Washington. Our guest is here today to celebrate his middle grade novel. It's called The Stone Boys. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Michael Gurian. Hey, Dr. Michael, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to have you on. I was recently a guest on Michael and Tim White's uh, podcast. And um, remind everybody, the, the, I don't want to mess up the name. It's the... the um, Parenting. Oh, the wonder, the wonder of parenting podcast. Wonder of parenting. Wonder of parenting podcast. And what a great time we had! You definitely have to check out that podcast. But um, before we ask people to check out the podcast, I need to ask you: What's the Stone Boys all about? Well, this is a novel of two teen boys, uh, seventeen and sixteen. It's set in Durango, Colorado. And one of those teen boys uh, is me, a foil for me. It's not me, but a foil for me, uh, because that's where I was in my teen years, Durango, Colorado. Um, his father, uh, Ben is his name, works on the Southern Ute Reservation doing a theater company, which my father did. So, you know, there's kind of a foil there. Uh, but um, uh, they form a friendship. And in their friendship, these two boys, Ben and Dave, they start discovering some hidden, you know, some things have gone on in the past for both of them. And it both brings them together and also kind of tears them apart uh, as they get involved in in uh, punish, trying to punish a bully who harmed Dave and all sorts of other things. So it's kind of a it's a thriller plot, very suspenseful, uh, and it has hidden content. Uh, it's appropriate for uh, like seventh grade on up. Uh, or any kids, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade on up. And some schools have u used it, you know, as a as a, a read, seventh grade read, eighth grade read. Uh, but I wouldn't say any younger than that mm -hmm. because so, there are a couple of graphic scenes of the tragedies that both these boys experienced when they were 10 uh, of sexual abuse. And, you know, those are graphic. So seventh grade on up is best. Yeah. It's from what I remember our conversation, it's, um, it's a lot about bullying and friendship, but it's mostly about coming of age. Am I right? Yeah, it's a coming of age novel. And the way they come of age, the kind of good versus evil that they're fighting in themselves and, and in their memories and even a bit in the world um, is kind of an initiation, a rite of passage for them. Uh, and they go in different directions. So I won't, you know, spoil it, but uh, these two boys don't end up in the same place. The the one boy, uh, so we did Sweat Lodge and Vision Quest on the reservation when I was there. And so the one boy gets into that, and that's really, really becomes a rite of passage for him. The other boy goes in another direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a tension there, but it's definitely coming of age, yeah. Yeah. As you're, you're mentioning, I'm thinking back to 
some of my best friends in in middle school and high school and yeah some of some of my best buddies took very different paths and um it, it it's kind of sad when I look back and um some of those guys aren't with us anymore oh okay did they get into the drugs or or what happened yeah yeah no the drugs and alcohol and drunk driving and some crime and you know uh, growing uh-huh. up in the inner, inner city, it wasn't surprising. Um, but y- there there comes a time, I think part of coming of age is, um, number one, deciding what path you're going to go on, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but also um, deciding who we should keep in our circle of friends and who we should mm. disinvite. Yeah, very true. Yeah, you have to, cer- certain piece of maturity is... Um, is deciding, okay, that's not a good friend for me anymore. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the growing up journey. And uh, it certainly is in the Stone Boys. Um, It's just, and the way it happens is through a thriller plot. But Ben has to decide this and um, because Dave is is going in another direction. And uh, and it's it's heart-wrenching, of course. You know, friendships in the teen years, uh, early teen, middle teen, they can be heart-wrenching, especially when that friendship is over. Um, and those are that because a kind of grief, you know, the emotions we go through include grief as it happens. And I think that's um, that's such an important thing for for, um, you know, middle readers, for teen readers to be to be feeling that. And I hope that the Stone Boys kind of gives a, 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 an environment, a climate in which they can feel this grief and go through these feelings because they're as well as the other feelings of bullying and how you respond to bullying. And then, and then, you know, part of the teen years, um, at least for me and for, so I'm a therapist as well. And so for a lot of my teen clients, part of the teen years, um, becomes, a uh, part of the coming of age is dealing with some things that happened in their own past. Mm-hmm. So if they had trauma or tragedy, um, like for instance, as I did, uh, cause you know, I was sexually abused, uh, and, and, a good thing to try to do during the teen years is to try to make some peace with that. And that usually takes into the college years, you know, it takes, it takes a while because like I started therapy at 16, but a lot of kids don't do that. So, um, uh, and this book, you know, it's not a piece of therapy, it's a novel, but it, it is, it is dealing with, um, the kind of grief of losing the friend and then also having to become mature. And the, this boy, Ben, who's my foil is lucky in that he has these relationships with these, the old uh, Eagle claw on the reservation and with his own father, Harvey, um, where he can try to get at some of what has been going on for him. And that, that I think is another sort of sub theme of the book, the relationships that kids have with adults, uh, that teens have with adults are still really, really important, (laughs) even though the teens are, you know, like, Oh, I'm done with the adults. Mm -hmm. But uh, those relationships are really important, and especially if the adults can look into the heart of the child, uh, the teen, and and help them, you know, and work with them. Because mm-hmm. teens teens are more desperate for adult, healthy adult attention than they'll let on. I, absolutely, um, and it is such such a th- sad and angering thing that there are adults that would take advantage of of that need for for their own and and, and abuse kids as had happened to you mhm oh yeah yeah that that uh the it's very self-serving of course for those adults they're they're all about power you know they for with sexual abuse they use sex but they are they're all about power and control and um the child is just a, a rewarding object for them you know, for them to do what they want to do. And um, they're, they're predators. Mm-hmm. And and in this book, both the predators are depicted. Um, uh, Dave's predator when he was young and Ben's predator when he was young. And, of course, they came from separate places. Ben comes to Durango just to spend a summer with his dad. His parents are divorced. So his predator was up in New York, um, which is where he was raised. And then, you know, Dave's was in Durango, where Dave was raised in Durango. And so different predators, all that, but there, you know, there's a commonality of the taking advantage, like you're saying, and of the power of power and control, and then of the, the potential damage. And part of, um, part of the Stone Boys is, a, a, it is about healing, 
It's just that that's really a subtext because it's a novel. But there's a, you know, there is a trajectory for healing that Ben gets on once he has the confrontations uh, and he's as he's fighting this evil. You know, he does get on a trajectory for healing, and I think that's that's very important. And I think it for like if adults read this book with kids or kids read it and talk to adults about it, and like teachers talk to students about it, um, that I think is part of the book, especially when the book is talked about. It won't be felt while reading it because suspense is what will be felt while reading it. But um, but talking about it later, that's a conversation because uh, if if one has been whether it's child abuse or sexual abuse or, or addiction or whatever it would be the trauma that a child experiences, um, there has to be a path, mm-hmm. you know, or this trauma will stay with the child and really in many ways ruin adult relationships that right. this child wants to have. Yeah. So much, so much to talk about here. Uh, one of the big things um, that I'm hearing from you about the Stone Boys is that this would be a really powerful book for all kids, not just kids who've experienced some some kind of abuse, but for all kids. I think especially for young boys, uh, for boys, because you know you were talking about you know when when we go through friendships and we're going to have very intense friendships that are going to end for whatever reason um, and that we need to be able to grieve those, those losses. But I know myself as I'm almost a hundred when I was a kid, if I was expressing grief and bummed out that my, you know, I wasn't friends with, with this guy anymore. And I was in eighth grade or freshman in high school. I know the reaction I would have had is suck it up. Big deal. What, you know, um, Life goes on. You just uh, you get another friend. Don't right. worry about it. And it, it, do young guys, do young girls have permission to grieve their friends the way they should these days? Yeah, I think it's a both and. Uh, on the one hand, there's nothing really wrong with uh, adults saying, uh, you know, I, I would we wouldn't say suck it up nowadays, right? Different language. But when you and I were growing up, um, yeah, that that's what we were told. Um, and and on the one hand, that's OK. It's it's OK to say that because it's real. You know, I mean, you, you have kids. I have kids. Our kids went through it. And I would say to them, OK, I know this is really painful, but, you know, a year from now, you really are not going to think about this. Mm-hmm. So just just kind of kind of grieve it and and just realize this. Um, and that would be in the suck it up category, I guess. And that, that's OK to say that. But on the other hand, yeah, it's also great if the child, the grieving and all of that is going to happen. Uh, the child's going to do some of it with peers and then some of it with trusted mentors and, um, you know, where they're able to talk about it. And maybe it's just with one person. Like my, I have two daughters. They grew up with us and with Gail and myself and with the godmother, Pam. And things they didn't want to talk to us about, they would talk to Pam about in this sort of adult category, um, uh, talking to an adult. And there was some grieving that went for both girls. They lost friends at certain times. And I know they talked to Pam about it. They talked a little with us about it. So it, I, I go with a both and. Mm-hmm. I don't think a child is ruined by someone saying, okay, uh, you know, I'm really sad for you, um, but I know you're going to get better mm-hmm. because it's true. You know, the child is going to get better. Um, and having these trusted mentors, I think that's the best of all worlds uh, to give the child. Because to some extent, it is important to say to kids, you know, maybe in a nice way, but be realistic. Mm -hmm. This happened to me. Let me pass on some wisdom to you. This happened to me when I was 15. I tell my story. My child rolls her eyes because she doesn't want to hear my story. But the story gets in there about me losing a friend, you know, and it gets in her head. And then she goes, okay, yeah, I guess we all survived this. So, so yeah, I think it's a both and. Yeah, yeah. But acknowledging that the kid is hurting and you understand that is a little bit better than just going, come on, suck it up, dude. Yeah, if that's all one says, one <laughs> sentence, then no. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, that's just we're not really helping there. <laughs> it's it's interesting that your character is, um, and part of the, at least part of the story is set on a um, Indian uh, reservation, Indian nation. Yeah, and um, and you spend some time there. Um, I'm really fascinated. I re- I'm a real fan of a of a. Uh, FX show that's that's out these days called Reservation Dogs, and it's about these young people coming to age on a um, reservation in Oklahoma, I believe. And while I never 
um, I think I've only driven through a, a reservation in upstate New York. There's like 10 miles of a highway that's part, part of one of the Indian nations, uh, the native tr- nations. But um, I'm, there's so much that these kids are going through that I relate to and remind me of things that I was dealing with as a kid growing up in the inner city. Um, is that uh, – can you talk a little bit more about your just experience of growing up on a, on a reservation? Yeah, well, we lived in um, Durango, Colorado, which is a few miles from the Southern Ute Reservation. So my dad, uh, who had this NEH grant, National Endowment for Humanities grant, um, uh, he has a – well, he had – he's passed away. But he had a Ph.D. in American Studies, but he had a master's in English and theater. And he had written plays and done some off-off-Broadway and that kind of thing. And so he got this grant through the tribal elders to help them create the first – it's called Ahimsa, the first traveling repertory Native American theater. So now remember, this is set in the past. This is this is all all accurate to time. That's set in 1975, which is when um, he was doing that. So we lived in Durango, and then I would go out with him and help with the plays. And then, so I didn't live on the res, mm-hmm. but but uh, but we lived you know a few miles away, and we were out there quite a bit. And it exposed me to both the the you know poverty. And um, difficulty of life on a, on a reservation, and it was called the Res then. So I refer to it as the Res in the book because that's exactly what it was called by the by the Indians, by mm-hmm. the Native Americans. Um, and so the poverty on the one hand, there was quite a bit of squalor, but on the other hand, also traditions uh, clo- closer to earth, vision quest, sweat lodge, and so and and a lot of the young guys went through that. Right. And some of them at, at that time, and I know it's still true now because I've done Sweat Lodge more recently here where I live. Some of the young uh, Native American guys are like, no, I don't care about any of that. You know, I'm leaving that. But a, but a lot of them are still going through Vision Quest and are still going through Sweat Lodge. So, you know, I I was one who was very spiritually curious. And and so I really got a lot from it. And luckily, the person who was the elder who helped my dad get the grant, he was okay with white people, you know? I mean, because there is enmity, Mm -hmm. you know? There is definitely, and tension. And I put in the book, I have a scene of of Ben, who's my foil, doing Sweat Lodge, and some of the guys really resent him being there, but some of the guys, you know, are trying to mentor him. And so, and that's really realistic to a reservation, especially for me as a white person, where we're, some are cool with it, of passing this on to white people, but a lot, a lot of people are not. Mm-hmm. You know, they want, they don't want white people anywhere near them. So I kind of capture some of that tension, and that is a tension on the res. And so, as a white person, constantly going in and out of the reservation with my dad and working there, um, that tension permeated uh, not just my life as a boy, but it permeated my dad's life in trying to work there. Because some people, like the elders, wanted this, but a lot of the, a lot of the people there, the Indian, um, you know, and Native American folks there, didn't, mm-hmm. didn't want him there, didn't want us there. So there's some real tension around that. Yeah, you're talking about traditions, and I know you've done a lot of work um, studying traditions of of coming of age and, and rites of passage. We don't, or do we? Uh, we we don't seem to have any formal rite of passage other than uh, high school graduation or whatnot. But we don't seem to have the same kind of rites of passage as, as some indigenous groups and, and groups in uh, other parts of the world. Do you think that's something that is missing in our current culture? Yeah. Oh, I think it's absolutely missing. And one way we can see it is, is well, we can see how important it is to kids – and especially to boys, and I'll give a biological reason why, especially to boys in a moment, um, it's very, very important. And we can see it because we can see boys who don't get rites of passage, who don't have the fathering and the male mentoring that puts them through the rites of passage, like like you would have Vision Quest and Sweat Lodge, et cetera, on a, on a res. They don't get it, but they go out and they join gangs. So they're going to go try to find a way to get it. Um, because you're right, we don't really have it. You get a driver's license, that's kind of a rite of passage, sure, and you drive yourself, 
there's certain independent, you know, elements of independence that a teen gets that are that can be rites of passage like that. And then, as you say, graduation. And there's a little bit if you do confirmation, um, you know, you could see that as a bit of a rite of passage if you're Christian, um, Jewish. So we have bar mitzvah, so and bat mitzvah. So there's a little bit there for sure. But um, but that kind of rite of passage experience and the con- which the native experience, which is the sort of rite of passage experience that all boys went through, you know, 200, 500, 800, 1,000 years ago, no matter their race, right, or no matter their culture, your relatives and mine were white. Our ancestors went through rites of passage, um, but they've died away. And, and, there's, and the reason that they're very important, and, and there is definitely a sort of sub- sub analysis in this book of rite of passage again it's it's a novel so you'd never know but it's a talking point in the questions at the end i talk about it you know so that the schools have uh you know lists of questions and all that and i, I talk about it there because boys boys uh, girls have an internal rite of passage that always reminds them of their purpose mm-hmm. of their need to mature um their you know their need to make good executive decisions and all, all these things and it's menstruation. And then they're only producing 200 eggs in a lifetime, you know, two to 300 eggs in a lifetime. There's a very sacred experience that they go through and painful experience that they go through. Uh, there's no equivalent for males. Um, all we do is get taller, grow hair and our voice gets lower, right? We don't have anything that doesn't remind us of our purpose. That doesn't help us understand how we are connected to earth and how we're connected to maturity and all of that. So all of our ancestors, no matter our race or culture, all of our ancestors put boys through rites of passage to train them to become uh, loving, wise, and successful men. And we've gone through a lot of political gender politics upheaval in the last 100 years, especially 50 years. And the idea was we got to cut out everything that's male. You know, anything having to do with male, cut it out because it's patriarchy and it's bad. And um, that was an overkill on it because, you know, we would all agree about patriarchy and about about toxic things males do that we don't want males to do anymore. We'd all agree on that. But Mm -hmm. uh, we threw the baby out with the bathwater here. So now we have a lot of guys who are not becoming men. You know, they're not going through rites of passage. They're not maturing. They're not developing purpose. Um, They're depressed. You know, now they're not connected. They're not goal oriented. And. and that's something that, that while the Stone Boys isn't really about that, you know, my other, uh, I have, as you said, a number of other books like Wonder of Boys, Saving Our Sons that are about that. Um, still, the Stone Boys tries to hint at it and say it is really, really important. And a lot of boys who don't get rice of passage, you know, we watch the things they do, not just gangs, but bullying. You know, they'll bully other kids. What they're really trying to do is grow up, but they're doing it in the wrong way. Um, or they become victims, constant victims of bullying. They can't, they, they haven't gone through a rite of passage that gives them the kind of confidence to just say, oh, you know, stop bullying me and to fight back. So, so there's all sorts of ramifications to not having rites of passage for boys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know uh, when you were mentioning um, girls and finding their purpose, you weren't trying to say that girl, the only purpose that girls have is to have babies and become moms. Oh, no, no. It's just a biological, right. you know, but we don't have that equivalent biological. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, all that old stuff about, you know, girls are only to have babies. No, no, that's not, that's not our world now. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no, it's, but it's a biological reality. So as you know, my work is in evolutionary biology and this biological reality, everything happening in the body has an effect on the brain and um, girls like the frontal lobe, you know, girls have this internal rite of passage and and they're constantly sending more signaling to the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is where a lot of maturity is, mm-hmm. executive decision-making, growing up. You know, A lot of it's up in the frontal. And boys don't have as much connectivity to the frontal, uh, but girls have it much more automatically. And then once they start um, menstruating and all of those hormones hit, they have even more. And, and so that's a biological reality that affects the brain. And um, I think what we forgot about, yeah, it doesn't limit girls, but what we forgot about in throwing out rites of passage for boys, and by the way, my daughters went through rites of passage, so I think they're great for everybody, for all children. Um, but 
what we threw out when we forgot how important they are for boys is we threw out that that without rites of passage, we're not getting as much connectivity to the frontal lobe. And that is what we must have. <laughs> if we want to end male violence, if we want to have mature boys, if we want to decrease male depression, of which we have an epidemic right now, you know, we have to investigate how the male brain does connection to the frontal. And then we have to bring back in a lot of the ways that males do that. Fatherhood is one of those, like having a father, you know, and male mentors, male role models, and rites of passage. And so there are many ways that we've thrown out that we're going to have to bring back. We'll just bring them back in a way that isn't Mm anti-female or that isn't anti-women's equality. You know, I mean, I'm a feminist, so so I'm not involved in any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But in studying biological development, we have to understand how important this is. Uh, especially to our young guys. Yeah. One of the things, and, and I, I think I've been wanting to ask this since we started, but it was it's um, I, I, an uncomfortable question, and um, so I should ask it. Yeah. A, 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 you mentioned that in the Stone Boys, um, your foil experiences the sexual abuse. Uh-huh. And I'm imagining that uh, if a family is reading this book together or co-reading it and having conversations, that if there is a kid out there, and there are thousands of kids out there who are experiencing abuse and they're suffering alone and it's not coming out and they're not sharing it with their with their families, there's a chance that reading this book, thankfully, will get them to say, hey, mom, dad, um, yep. this happened to me. Uh What's the best way for a parent to react if a kid comes in and says, look, I'm being hurt. Somebody's hurting me in this way. Yeah. Um, well, generally, because this book's going to be read by 13 and older, um, uh, I think what the child will do is do what we call disclosure of the past. So this child would – and by the way, I have gotten mail. People who have read this read the, this book, their sons have read it, and – they have, you know, sent me, you know, I, I'm really honored. They've sent me fan mail that says, well, this had the effect you wanted it to have, which was that my son disclosed. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that such and such happened when he was nine. And so um, while I didn't write the book for that single intention, I was hoping that by making it a young adult novel um, for people to read in the teen years, that that would happen for some people, right? That for everyone else, it would just be an understanding of the of the trauma and everything else. But for some people, it would lead to. So for parents, parents, we have to go into this um, knowing that when we hear it, uh, if we hear it from a child, girl or boy, whoever the child is, we're going to feel like failures, right? We're going to have to fight through our own immediate reactive feeling, which is, which is, oh, yuck. Right. But underneath is I failed. I didn't protect my child. So we're going to want to be in some therapy um, because, of course, this thing isn't our fault. But we as parents are going to take that on. So just for parents, always be aware of that. Make sure to be getting in therapy to work through it. And then we need to be helping the child to get connected with counseling. Um, some of it will probably end up being family counseling, especially if the person who has abused our child was close. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, most abuse, so in my book, the abusers are a, a um, uh, I'm not going to tell what one abuser is because it's part of the plot, but the abuser of me is a direct, a direct rendition of what happened to me. So what happened to Ben when he was 10 is a direct rendition. That was a psychiatrist who was my molester. And, um, and then there's one thing added for plot that didn't happen to me, but everything else in the book happened to me. I disclosed to my parents when I was 18. I had been in therapy since I was 16 for other things because I was acting out on all sorts of stuff, which were, of course, connected mm-hmm. to the trauma. But, you know, when I was 18, I disclosed to my parents. And by then I had been in counseling. I continued in counseling through college. That's really, you know, kind of what we want. We want the parents to fight fight against their own, you know, yuck and their own I'm a failure and and help the child get the resources uh, because unless the parents are therapists or even if they are, they're probably going to need someone else mm-hmm. to help the child. And, and that I think is the best approach. 
Um, I think that things, when I was 18, I'm, I'm born in 1958, so when I was 18 and disclosed to my parents, it was 1976, there were less resources then. Mm-hmm. There's a lot more confusion about this. Now, in 2022, 2023, there are so many resources, and we as parents, we as adults, have heard about this, right, for 40 years. We've been hearing about this in terms of the pre-scandals and so on. So we, I think, have more intuitive vocabulary, you know, to help the child and say, okay, um, how far did it go? Are you willing to tell me what happened, you know, so we can deal with that? And are <coughs> excuse me, are you having sexual confusions? Um, I, you know, can I help you with that? Uh, and in the back, even of the Stone Boys, I've got some stuff in there to help people, you know, to have the conversations. Because one of the things about male sexual abuse that is especially confusing and that we probably don't talk enough about uh, is that it's a difference from female. When female... Um, when women are abused and raped, they are not getting pleasure from that. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a, a total power over, and the person who is raping them or abusing them is in ge- generally not trying to give them pleasure. Mm-hmm. It's taking all the pleasure. One thing that's confusing for males is that generally in male sexual abuse, the male does, the boy does ejaculate. He does have orgasm. It's part of the abuse and the molestation. And that's very confusing uh, because and we have to talk to young people about that uh, you know the guys who have been abused about that and say okay okay that's that was normal and um, it's part of the confusion that you have now um, and it also creates confusion for boys since most abusers are, are adult men ab- around ho- homosexuality and sexuality right and so they're confused about whether they're gay or not because they had pleasure mm-hmm. with a man even though, of course, they were 10 years old and abused. Well, we can talk, we can as adults talk to boys about this, and we have to if we're going to fully help them because this is now part of their journey, and they're trying to sort through it. So does that make some sense? I I think it does. I think it does. And the other thing that I'm getting from this conversation is that there is a way to help kids. It sounds like you've come out of your, your experience, you learned from it, you grew from it, you're mm-hmm. helping others. One of the expressions that you've, that I've heard people used um, in, in talking about uh, abusers is this is a horrible thing and when you do this to, to a kid, you ruin the kid forever. And um, I think it's, it's horrible to abuse a kid. I think it's, it's, it's a crime. But I don't, th- I don't think I'd ever use the word that you ruin a kid. You absolutely no, hurt a kid. No, But there's a, there's a way back from this. Yeah, and that is depicted, again, it's all subtext. No one would ever know it, but that's depicted in this book because you have one kid, my foil, who, you know, who, will, who is resilient. Like, I am resilient, um, and I am definitely not ruined. Um, but you have another kid who, who goes down the evil path. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and, so, and so that is real. And that would be the kid who I guess, you know, I would say is ruined. But he also doesn't get resources. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very clear that he, his family system is not going to be able to understand this, that he, you know, and he, he, he's actually a very evil character in in some adult novels I'm writing, which I'll, which I'll publish over the next few years. He's that evil person. He becomes that evil person who's really a bad person. And so, yeah, he would be ruined, but. But no, I never go into it as a therapist with um, teens or adults who disclose. I never go into it thinking they're ruined. It's all about it's all it's all going to be about processing and then resilience. And um, like me, I, I use myself as an example. So I was molested, but I don't you know I don't molest anyone else. I mean I I I'm a I'm a very good fine adult, right? But I what did I get ultimately from it is I can imagine anything bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like when I when I read Stephen King or those sorts of novels, I think, OK. And then later we we know that things happened to Stephen King when he was young. And what it does for some some of us, many of us, is it gives us the ability to imagine stuff that no one else is going to imagine. It's so horrific. And that's where it stays. And then for me, it comes into a book. I can write a book in which bad things happen 
and it can get integrated into the life journey. Um, and so, so for my, for my clients, people I'm working with and, and, you know, to your question about ruining my language for them is this is going to become a part of your resilience. It's going to be become a part of your empathy. You're going to be able to be empathic to people in a way that other people who have not been abused or not challenged to be empathic. Um, you're going to be resilient in ways that other people who have not been sexually abused are going to be resilient. And, and then you're going to probably have some imaginings and some stuff that in your life that is a leftover, but you know, just integrate it. You're going to integrate it as part of your life. Uh, if you had been beaten by your parents, you would be having to integrate that. Uh, if you were raised in poverty, you would have to integrate that. That will be part of your, you know, it's, it's a trauma informed self-development. Um, but you're definitely not ruined. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. I think that's a great, great exclamation point to put on a conversation here, uh -huh. except that I want people to know where they can go to find out more about your books and also more about your, your, uh, the, the Gurian Institute. Okay. So the work that I do in, in schools and all of that is on GurianInstitute.com. Our whole team is there. Uh, that's G-U-R-I-A-N, GurianInstitute.com. Uh, in terms of me and the books I've written, michaelgurian.com houses all of that, uh, especially my books. And uh, But if people want to immediately get the Stone Boys, you know, Amazon or barnesandnoble.com, any of those, you know, you can order it through there. Um, and if people want, if they read it and they think, oh, you know, yeah, I would, I would use this in my eighth grade English class or psychology class or my 12th grade psychology class, then, you know, they could just email info at gurianinstitute.com and... And then we work it out and our publisher sends bulk because that's what s some schools are doing, mm -hmm. right? Is doing it as a, as a, a read like that. So all of that can be accessed through gurianinstitute.com or michaelgurian.com. We've had a really powerful conversation with the author of The Stone Boys, Dr. Michael Gurian. Hey, Dr. Michael, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Jed. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Misty Black. She'll be here to celebrate Klutz the Cat Learns to Do Hard Things. Great conversation about social emotional learning. Hey, I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to start by thanking our, our guest, Dr. Michael Gorian. Please be sure to check out the Stone Boys. Also, want to thank my team, Fata Makan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. <laughs>